just heard the title of, of my thesis, and I'd like to start out by actually just thanking everyone on my committee uh, for spending the time to uh, to a read through my thesis and then and then uh, provide feedback and, and show up today to uh, to provide some insight and critiques and, and to listen to me. Um, so I'm going to start off by just uh, uh, mentioning kind of an obvious fact here that uh, wireless communication systems have really undergone considerable changes over the past 10, uh, 10 years or so. Uh, in 1999, 20% of American citizens used cell phones. And as of last year, that number skyrocketed to 89%. Um, in addition, well over half of American adults actually use the internet uh, wirelessly, whether it's via cell phone or a laptop. And rather than traditional voice phone calls, uh, people use their cell phones over wireless networks to send texts, check Facebook status, uh, tweet. Uh, in addition, I use my, uh, my Android cell phone a lot for calendar appointments. Uh, uh, also, many friends and colleagues utilize their cell phones as a primary source of music and video for, for entertainment, whether it's things on, uh, on the device itself or streaming from sites like Pandora. Now, key drivers to allow these types of, uh, this type of usage have been mainly a combination of physical layer advances and also an increase in device usability. Now, uh, physical layer advance, advances include um, recent changes like you know, turbo codes and, and some MIMO findings, in addition to some older findings like trellis code modulation and of recent interest are low density parity check codes that traditionally were too uh, complex to implement. However, given increases in processing power, and, uh, and battery, these techniques can now be implemented. And so uh, platforms nowadays have the processing power to implement these advanced techniques. They're small enough so that a user can actually put it in his pocket and feel comfortable walking around with them. And, and in addition, they also last long enough to maintain a solid user, uh, uh, user base basis. <clears throat> now, to meet user demand, devices really have to support multiple services and protocol. Um, most popular include CDMA and GSM, depending upon if you have Verizon or, say, AT&T as a carrier. Uh, in addition, a lot of devices support Bluetooth and Wi-Fi to provide uh, links back to such features as streaming Pandora and, uh, and, and access to the Internet. Um, currently, these devices uh, most often use application-specific integrated circuits, or ASICs, uh, in order to provide the protocol functionality uh, to, to interface with all of the desired applications. Uh, with, in the case of a laptop, you can also apply many radio dongles uh, or, say, a Bluetooth network or, or a, a Wi-Fi network. In the future, however, software-defined radios uh, will really take over, and they will be the platform of, of choice for, for, for these systems. So what is a software-defined radio? Really, it just uh, is a communication system that moves processing closer to the antenna. So while traditionally, you know, source channel coding and even modulation uh, have been implemented in, in ASICs, uh, now those functions are going to be implemented in software. Why is this a big deal? Why is it desirable? Well, now these protocols for GSM, for Wi-Fi, for Bluetooth can be adapted on the fly with a simple downloading of code. Uh, in addition, let's look at Bluetooth and Wi-Fi where they operate in the same, same band. Um, you can have more efficient implementations rather than having two devices that are both looking in the same area. You can combine them and have more efficient implementations. Now, this full access to the physical air, of course, has benefits and drawbacks. Uh, here we see a bunch of the more well-known SDR platforms, one of which is the WinLab Cognitive Radio. <coughs> so, what is a Cognitive Radio? Cognitive Radio is really the addition of intelligence to a software-defined radio. So. A software-defined radio with intelligence will give you full five-layer access and can make some operational decisions. It was first uh, really brought to the surface by uh, Joseph Nicola in, in 2000, who is now, I believe, at uh, Stevens Institute. Uh, in the course of this thesis, we're going to talk about three main uses of physical layer information. So now that we have physical layer information, can we use it to enhance overall situational awareness? Can we use it to act as an adversary? And can we use it to mitigate things such as poor environments or, in fact, adversaries themselves? 
Uh, this talk will center along four main uh, areas. First, I'm going to talk for a moment about experiment methodology. Um, then we'll move into some situational awareness techniques, specifically how to discover specific services and device identification. Uh, then we'll talk about mobility detection and uh, course location detection. Then we'll talk a little bit about uh, attacks, all right, whether it's a survey of existing real world dangerous physical layer based attacks. Uh, and then we'll extend some ideology to, uh, to, to LIMA, which is a, uh, a current hotbed of research and most emerging wireless systems actually incorporate some form of multi input, multi output. Uh, then we'll also talk about mitigation with regard to traditional strategies and we'll offer up a technique to defend against the exploit that we present in, in the second session. Uh, and then a more uh, targeted uh, way to mitigate things like a severe multipath environment uh, or a severe jamming scenario. So experiment methodology. Uh, in the course of this thesis, we combine classical theoretical analysis with computer simulations based on, on MATLAB with actually real world experimentation using a current software defined radio. Uh, for all of the experiments, we essentially use GNU radio combined with the USRP software defined platform that costs roughly $1,000. Uh, and really, thanks to Eric Blossom, who has had an association with Wing Lab that many of you know, and um, Matt Edis for developing uh, these utilities. Pictured, you see the USRP and the GNU radio system. Uh, in fact, the GNU radio and the USRP combine very nicely to provide a cognitive platform. Uh, on the laptop itself, which is the host, or the general purpose processor, signal processing blocks are developed in C++ and integrated with you know, existing, um, existing higher layer coding framework, such as Python, uh, to implement a user desired signal processing uh, function. Uh, the USRP itself is really the hardware interface to the outside world, and it essentially provides RF access. And so, based upon its USB 2.0 interface to, to the host, uh, the USRP is responsible for converting RF to IF to baseband data so that a user on the host can process uh, you know, baseband data and then do whatever he really needs. Now, the USRP itself couples with something called an RF daughter board to provide RF access. And there are many <laughs> RF daughter boards providing access to different portions of the spectrum. So in the course of this thesis, we used a decent amount of them. Uh, that's highlighted in green here. So let's move forward to situational awareness. So situational awareness is important uh, in current and future wireless networks because one needs to really under its, understand its environment to optimally decide what to do in a given scenario. Um, an example would be co-channel interference and interference of uh, protocols that don't necessarily work very well with each other. Okay, let's talk Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. There's a lot of work that shows um, um, some surprising results, uh, I'd say, about how bad Bluetooth interferes with Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi doesn't interfere with Bluetooth due to its frequency hopping nature. Uh, in, in addition, given a lot of work in dynamic spectrum access, um, it's very important to understand primary users versus secondary users and you know what resources are available uh, in, to do to use. Now, some researchers who may be in the room um, have brought up the idea of a global control plane where you just access this broadcast channel that tells you where everybody is and what they're using. But if that doesn't exist, can we use physical layer information to come up with our own idea of who's in the region and what specific services and devices are, are, are around and available? <coughs> we focus on physical layer and because it's available and also because implementing full protocols for all of these systems just may not be practical. It may be too expensive to do. Uh, in addition, certain networks and devices may be operating in an undiscoverable mode, or in fact, might be partially observable. One of the issues with using our current cognitive platform is the fact that we are constrained to really about four megahertz of usable bandwidth based upon that USB 2.0 interface. Okay, and so while I can't see a 20 megahertz 802.11 um, beacon frame, I can see a portion of it. So by just seeing a portion of it, partially observable in frequency, 
are there things that I can do to detect the, number, the, the services that are there? Can I say there are multiple access points around, or even how heavily loaded is this Bluetooth network, even though I'm not looking at the entire, the entire thing? Uh, so here we see a spectrogram, which is a frequency versus time plot of the ISM band, where we have Bluetooth and Wi-Fi both active at this time. On the left, we clearly see 802.11g beacon frames. Beacon frames are periodic, 20 megahertz wide OFDM signals um, that jump through this one, uh, excuse me, this is a 500 millisecond snapshot. Okay, if we zoom in, on a 50 millisecond region right here, we can clearly see two Bluetooth bursts popping amidst this Wi-Fi beacon frame. This Bluetooth, um, as the protocol mandates, uses one megahertz wide instantaneous uh, GF, excuse me, one megahertz instantaneous bandwidth GFSK pulses. And uh, as I said earlier, frequency hops to over 75, 79 megahertz of the ISM band. So. Are there things we can do just leveraging a small snapshot to determine that Bluetooth and Wi-Fi are in the area? Well, with a simple physical layer service discovery algorithm, take a snapshot in time and go ahead and analyze physical layer features such as burst widths, um, modulation estimations, uh, leading edge times. We can also look at bandwidth estimations and so on and so forth to come up and classify that Bluetooth is probably in the area, and Wi-Fi is probably in the area. Now, this just tells us whether or not services are there. It doesn't necessarily tell us how many Bluetooth uh, access points are in the region, or Pico nets, I'm sorry, how many Wi-Fi networks are in the region. So one thing we wanted to, to, to do is look further and see if we can identify distinct devices rather than just the notion of a Wi-Fi network is, is in the area. And, and again, such knowledge of just knowing that a Wi-Fi network is in the area and a Bluetooth network in the area is it is good. Um, why? Because of those coexistence principles we talked about earlier, where maybe it's not smart for me to go ahead and, uh, and, and introduce a Bluetooth network into a Wi-Fi region because I want to be concerned about everybody else in the region. So I would choose a different protocol, or maybe select on a subset of higher layer, of higher frequencies, so that I'm not interfering with existing devices. So Bluetooth, let's talk for a moment about the specific protocol. A Bluetooth PicoNet or a Bluetooth network consists of one master and can have up to seven active slaves. Everyone is synchronized to the master's clock, and time slots are 625 microseconds long. All of the transmissions believe on, they begin on excuse me, time slot boundaries, and the specification allows for timing accuracy, leading edge, leading edge accuracy excuse me, of 20 microseconds. What does this mean is that there are some simple things that we can do one of which is a time banging approach. So in this uh, sort of scenario, what we do is we split up a single time slot, single Bluetooth time <laughs> slot, into 25 bits. And we, we chose 25 bits just because it's a nice uh, arbitrary number that results in 25 microsecond uh, bin widths. And by analyzing leading edge times from physical layer data, we can collapse all leading edge times back into a common time slot to see where these leading edges coincide, right? And so this scenario right here could show you that there are probably two active Bluetooth Pico nets in the region. Now we implemented this uh, with the new radio and the USRP uh, in a real world. I was actually just checking my voicemail at home uh, a few years ago, and I'll play that video right now, which you'll see up top here that uh, we split into 25, uh, 25 bins, each of 25 microsecond bin width. And what will happen is uh, detections are on the y-axis and the bin is on the x-axis. As I'm checking my voicemail, you clearly see all the leading edges being collapsed into uh, a, single, uh, a single time bin. Now, one thing you probably noted is the fact that it's moving. And that's a, a nice kind of reminder that this is the real world. And in the real world, you have things like local oscillator drift, which is responsible for things like that. As I mentioned, the, the master clock is, it, it provides the time and the synchronization for everybody in the network. And so as he drifts, everyone's going to drift, drift because they're, they're synchronized with him. And so that's why you see leading edge times drifting uh, along the, uh, uh, in, into other bits. Okay? So let's just close this out.
Now, another more reliable method of discovering uh, Bluetooth keypress would be to further delve into the protocol. And in the general Bluetooth packet, the very beginning has an access code. That access code is derived from a Bluetooth uh, device address of the master and uh, stays for the entire lifetime of that Ethernet as long as you synchronize to that master. So by decoding Bluetooth packets, at least the channel access code, we can have a definitive way to say, this is network A, this is network B. And so it's just a more reliable uh, way to detect network networks. And of course, it's obviously a little bit more um, a little bit less efficient to do because you're doing more processing. So higher reliability with more processing. Uh, in that same snapshot we looked at earlier, which was 50 milliseconds of the ISM band, we have two Bluetooth bursts. So we're going to do a bit comparison, uh, the demodulation approach on those two bursts. Here is burst one, uh, instant fre instantaneous frequency versus sample. There is burst two. If we do a bitwise exclusive pour on the demodulation of these two bursts, we end up seeing that the first 68 to, uh, excuse me, the first 72 bits are exactly the same, which tells me that they're the same channel access code. And again, it's really just a, a simple demodulation algorithm that tells me that these two bursts are involving the same, <coughs> the same PicoNet. Um, let's move to Wi-Fi and talk. Uh, there's, there's obviously a bunch of things that we can do with Wi-Fi that I won't talk about uh, right now in the interest of time. But one that I will talk about is channel estimation. And by leveraging protocol-specific information and channel estimates, we can, in fact, differentiate Wi-Fi access points. Okay, so Wi-Fi access points are relatively, they're typically stationary. And they transmit beacon frames, as we talked about earlier, uh, in a periodic fashion. These peak in frames are 20 megahertz OFDM signals uh, that utilize 64 subchannels that are each spaced 312.5 kilohertz apart. At the beginning of every beacon frame transmission, there is a training sequence and an equalization sequence. The training sequence is, again, 8 microseconds, and the equalization sequence is 8 microseconds. They're really used for channel sounding. A client will estimate the channel based upon the knowledge that these signals are transmitted. So can we use these transmissions to estimate the channel between an access point and, say, a rogue access point? <clears throat> By um, looking at the channel estimation procedure, we have a received signal, which is going to be the signal that was transmitted um, going over the channel with some additive noise component. Since we know what the signal uh, transmitted was, we can come up with a rough estimate, uh, excuse me, an estimate of the channel spectrum uh, with some additive noise component right here. So the idea is that every time I receive a beacon signal, I obtain a channel estimate. I use this channel estimate to correlate against known existing access points in my database. And if I am close enough to any of the channel estimates in my database, I conclude that this beacon frame came from that access point. If it's far enough away, then it's probably a new access point in the region. One interesting observation, again, we spoke earlier about uh, the real world and how uh, you know things in MATLAB don't necessarily equate to something that's going to work in the real world. And so in doing some of our experiments, we realized, wow, this really isn't working. Why? Well, one of the reasons is because we're utilizing phase in this equation. And in a real world system where an access point is going to transmit a burst in time, and then at some other point later, it's going to transmit a burst in time, uh, there are two reasons why uh, the phase really shouldn't be used. One is implementation of the, of the DSP program or the program or otherwise. He never really, he, he may or may not mandate that this pulse, this beacon frame starts with the same initial phase. Additionally, the local oscillator itself is going to be at a different position, which is going to result in an offset of the initial transmitted phase. So even if the channel is the same, the phase is not. What does that do? Well, it changes our equation to uh, basically only use magnitude. Now our correlation range is collapsed to the interval of 0 to 1. And in fact, we did a real world experiment with this where I set up two access points, identical access points, changed them to have the same SSID, uh, PRI, everything exactly the same. Okay, so one is really a true rogue access point and the other is not. Here's a plot of normalized magnitude versus time using our new radio USRP device. And in fact, we see varying magnitudes. Okay, 
these are the two beacons from access point one and access point two. And, and of course, they're using the same default PRI, a periodic prioritization interval. And so that um, at the next time, you know, they have the same sort of time relationship. But you'll note that in the first, uh, the beacon one and beacon two, access point one had the higher magnitude, whereas now access point two has the higher magnitude. And so the results that I'm about to show you clearly aren't just the fact that, well, I was closer to access point one all the time, so pure magnitude uh, tells me that it, you know, it was access point one if he's higher than access point two. Um, by correlating, um, after we, see, we receive an estimate uh, for this experiment, what we did is we correlated to uh, the previous beacon and then the beacon before it. And because of the nature of the experiment, you should always see a higher correlation to two beacons back rather than one beacon. And this is, in, in fact, exactly what we see. So we see a high correlation going two beacons back and a relatively low correlation just one beacon back. <clears throat> now, let's talk for a moment about some other um, situational awareness techniques that, that we've looked at uh, based purely on the fly layer. In PLATEAU, which stands for Physical Layer Techniques for Advanced Situational Awareness, we leverage existing devices, um, sort of a passive radar technique um, to come up with mobility awareness and location discovery. Now, there's a decent amount of related work in the area where um, in, uh, in TAN in 2005, uh, they actually implemented a passive radar system uh, with the GSM tower to detect, uh, the, the, uh, to detect cars, basically, an impl the implementation of passive radar. Uh, in addition, um, uh, Marco and his group did some work with detecting co-located mobile devices. So, um, devices that are moving together, they leverage some fading properties of the channel to say that these two devices are probably walking together. That's really the reverse problem of what we looked at here, where I'm a device, I have access to the physical layer. How can I tell if I'm inside or I'm moving, so on and so forth? Key to these exploits were to take advantage of uh, certain types of signals. One, I want signals to be stationary, FM signals, television signals, GSM towers, they're not moving anywhere, okay? And so the fact that they're stationary means that I can probably take advantage of them um, because then I can leverage the property of me being mobile or me being not mobile if I know they're not mobile. Same can be said for Wi-Fi access points if I don't consider the fact that my phone now can act as a Wi-Fi access point. I can obviously move with it. The traditional sense, Wi-Fi access points don't go anywhere. Uh, in addition, it's very nice to have consistent transmit signal strength, such as downwind control channels of GSM and Wi-Fi beacons. As a quick example of mobility, we monitored television broadcast signals which transmit a known pilot tone, and we essentially just did a bunch of Doppler shift measurements. So we ran an experiment where uh, I set up the new radio the USRP in my car, and I began stationary and I was monitoring uh, here a single television signal, I believe channel 25 or um, uh, one of those one of those channels, I'm sorry. Um, and what I did was I went from a complete stop to moving to a maximum speed of about 25 miles an hour, and then I ended 20 seconds later and then came to another stop. And so clearly by just looking at the Doppler shift of that pilot tone, I can detect mobility. Now, by incorporating multiple television signals, I can actually estimate uh, qualitatively, excuse me, quantitatively, uh, my mobility by looking at the maximum Doppler shift associated with that. Because I never know if I'm moving towards it, moving directly away from it, going uh, perpendicular to the signal. So by more and more and more and more signals, I can actually come with, uh, come with a better estimate. And this, this year, actually, uh, unbeknownst to me, I was moving pretty much directly away from the tower, and so you can see my Doppler shift uh, equates to a velocity of about minus 25 miles per hour, which coincides very well with the experiment. Now, talking about the real world and issues associated with it, there is uh, an interesting observation here. If anybody sees, there, there, is, there is sort of a drift here, right? So I have a frequency offset when I am, in fact, stationary. Now, that... I struggle with my clicker here. <laughs> that is actually due to local oscillator instability. And so how do I alleviate that? Because I don't want to say that I'm stationary when I'm not stationary. Well, leveraging properties of the television channel itself, if I listen to a station that's very low in frequency, the faster that I move, 
the lower frequency devi deviation I'm going to see. As an example, if I'm looking at channel 2, which is at 54 megahertz, at a velocity of 25 miles per hour, I'm only going to see a Doppler shift of 2 hertz, okay? Whereas uh, I believe I was listening to channel like 187 or something like that. I should have it here, but I don't remember. Um, so by looking at a lower frequency as your baseline, you can remove things associated with LO references. Okay. So how much yes. should the local oscillator drift be in terms of radius light? Sure. Sure. So um, good question. And it really depends upon the, the the hardware itself, right? So for the USRP, it has a local oscillator rated at uh, uh, 20 ppm. And so 20 ppm at uh, let's say 2.4 gigahertz will be 48 kilohertz of, of offset. Now that's not drift, right? It's just right. one next to another one. They could be anywhere from 48 kilohertz off. Uh, it, it could result in drift, and it could also uh, be affected by temperature. Temperature is also in the equation in terms of local oscillator drift, depending upon you know what type what type of local oscillator you have. The USRP uses an ovenized crystal local oscillator, again, rated at 20 ppm. There are higher priced local oscillators, like a rubidium clock, that will be much, 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 much lower. So using a much better system, uh, you can get this down to um, a really negligible, right? But the cheaper the system, the more you're going to hear, you're going to have uh, drift wise yeses. So if you're to look at a pair of power tones mm -hmm. at different frequencies, yes. <clears throat> look at the Doppler shift and the difference essentially because you eliminate any dependence on variation on local oscillators. You, you actually probably could. That's, that's, a, that's a good idea by using independent local oscillators. You, if you could average, you, you could essentially <laughs> average, average things out. Right. That, that's a great point. Um, so moving on, we, we talked about mobility. And uh, as I said, uh, I'm, I'm going to do just an overview of a lot of these techniques. There's a lot left out, but in, in the interest of time, I'm only going to talk about a selection of them. Um, the signal quality comparison is a method to get coarse device location, MI inside versus MI outside. Again, here I'm exploiting the fact that I, I really know where these transmitters are. Right? The GSM tower, um, if you don't think about a slide I'm going to tell you later, is always going to be outside. Okay? Wi-Fi access points typically inside. So by monitoring GSM base stations and Wi-Fi access points, I can come up with signal quality estimates. Uh, signal quality estimates that we use for this specific experiment uh, for GSM just use the the mean magnitude versus the vari over the variance and Wi-Fi since it doesn't uh, doesn't necessarily have a constant envelope uh, we end up using the noise floor as the denominator of our signal quality estimate and so what happens is I, as I'm uh, as I'm inside on the red line right here uh, excuse me the, the the blue line for GSM my signal quality is going to be statistically worse than when I'm outside. Uh, by the same regard, Wi-Fi signal is going to be nicer inside as opposed to outside. And so by looking at transition regions over time, if my GSM signal gets better and my Wi-Fi drops, more than likely I'm moving outside as opposed to inside. And so just you know, general physical layers, statistical observations can, can provide that sort of course location analysis. So, as I stated earlier, the second phase of uh, this thesis is really focused on attack. Okay, um, now that we have access to the physical layer, yeah, it's great. It gives us all this uh, this added situational awareness and benefits, but it also gives the same benefits to our adversary, right? And so our adversary can go ahead and implement some some of these techniques to attack our network. So we should, in fact, understand these techniques uh, in order to a best mitigate them or b. To, you know, react, react in this environment and punish someone who's trying to punish us. Now, there's a slew of work on physical layer-based attacks using current software-defined radios. In fact, here's a list of uh, very popular ones using the GNU Radio USRP. Um, the Adroit project by DBNN uh, initially started a while ago, and it was really just to passively listen to one megabit a second uh, 802.11 um, packets. Really wasn't uh, wasn't that impressive, but it was a, a nice start. Uh, this gentleman uh, came along and moved a lot of that functionality to the FPGA and now can do full 20 megahertz uh, demodulation and uh, can get select packets that way. Um, we have a Zigbee implementation. 
we have uh, Dominic Spill and Michael Osman came up with something called GR Bluetooth, which is a passive implementation of the Bluetooth stack. Um, very, very, very interesting. Now, again, it doesn't hop along the 79 megahertz, it only looks like a little portion, but still, still quite impressive. Uh, with regard to GSM, uh, in 2007, Joshua Lackey uh, came up with some code to decode things like broadcast control channels and access grants and so on and so forth from uh, GSM networks. Uh, Karsten Knoll took that and essentially, um, how do I how do I say, he, he skirts the legal boundary right now because he offers code to look at traffic data and he also has some utilities that incorporate cryptographic rainbow tables to code and, uh, decode and decrypt uh, uh, voice. So there's a lot of interesting work uh, there uh, with regard to exploits against uh, A51, uh, which is uh, a GSM encryption technique that is used primarily in Europe. I believe the US has a patch and they've upgraded it to A53. Um, of interest as well is OpenBTS. Uh, David Burgess and, and his colleague Samra um, implemented basically what's a GSM uh, base station, a full transceiver with a single USRP. And so uh, they can actually put this device in the room and your cell phone to it and associate with it if they have the proper MNC, MCC, and everything like that. So uh, again, uh, very, very kind of interesting and scary exploits of uh, this, this SDR system. Um, they actually have a, a good goal in mind and uh, they, they wish to provide uh, cellular access to third world countries where it's not cost effective to employ or deploy a, uh, a, a true base station. Um, a while back there were some exploits by some guys at MIT where they actually hacked uh, the Charlie Card and were able to put random values on their uh, Massachusetts Bay uh, Bay card. And it's, it's, it's interesting because in, in a slide you see 37 cents left on your card and in the next slide there's a couple thousand dollars. Uh, there is a wireless MiFi card based uh, on that, and Noel recently has had some work in regard to breaking that encryption as well. Uh, and I believe he's at the University of Virginia right now. Uh, finally, TPMS, Tire Pressure Monitoring Systems. Uh, that's actually work done joint between us here at Wing Lab and uh, University of South Carolina, where we, uh, we, we showed the exploits available to, uh, uh, to tire pressure monitoring systems, where we were able to uh, really breach the car itself to control uh, the display of the dashboard and actually gain access to the car CCU. Uh, one of our experimenters down in South Carolina um, had her had an unpleasant trip to the dealer, I'd say, with a broken car ECU based upon our wireless exploits. So uh, now I'm going to talk for a moment about, uh, I guess, MIMO. So most current immersion systems have some form of multiple input, multiple output operation. This is able to 11N, WiMAX, 3GBP, and, and beyond. A lot of the existing research has only included really natural inhibitors such as noise, time bearing channel. Uh, in addition, work that has looked at adversaries really look at adversaries as, kind of, as, as quasi dumb, not necessarily protocol <laughs> smart. They're not aware of, uh, or not trying to take advantage of specific protocol exploits. And as you look more and more into the protocol, you can of course come up with you know, more and more uh, dangerous attacks. So the question here was, can we effectively formulate smart bylayer attacks against my systems? So in a MIMO channel here, we have a bunch of transmitters and a bunch of receivers and each path from a transmit to a two-way receiver will experience a different, um, a different channel. Uh, yeah, gain and, and, and phase shift. So as we go along here, most MIMO schemes actually require knowledge of the channel itself. Uh, they can do, they can gain this knowledge uh, be, via a, a couple of mechanisms. A, they can directly estimate the channel themselves based upon a known pilot transmissions. Or one can estimate the channel and then send a message back to the other with, with the estimate of, of what he thinks the channel is. <coughs> that obviously needs to be done within the time coherence of the channel to make sense. Now, as an example, 802.11n has these fields in their packets called high throughput long training fields that are just for that express purpose. Transmitter 1 will send uh, from Alice, will we'll transmit here. Bob will estimate all of the paths to all of his receivers. And then the next transmitter will go up, the next transmitter, and the next transmitter. Now, we focus on attacking solely the CSI estimation procedure. Why? Because 
actually it's efficient, it's effective, and it's covert. Typically, the training sequences are much smaller portions of the overall transmission. Um, in addition, by only coming up active on this training sequence, as a jammer, E can actually remain quiet and have the decoding fail during the data transmission. So again, efficient, covert, and, and quite effective. Now, perhaps the most studied MIMO technique is based on the singular value decomposition, um, where estimates of the channel are needed by both Alice and Bob, and they compute the SVD of the channel. So they have left singular vectors, right singular vectors, and the eigenvalues of the channel. Alice will pre-code her intended message X with the left, uh, excuse me, the right singular vectors of the channel B. Bob will receive R and operate on it with the left singular vectors of the channel. In essence, this results in um, the minimum of the receive antenna and transmit antenna uh, parallel SISO channels. <coughs> now, uh, it's of course well known that uh, you can maximize the channel capacity in such a system by applying a, a water filling algorithm over the best known um, channels. So, in looking to attack any system, it's really often a good idea to, to think about what you can do in the ideal scenario. And then you can go ahead and, and look at practical attacks and what you can possibly do uh, if you don't have as much control as you would in the ideal scenario. Now, in the ideal scenario, we're not really going to talk about much of it, uh, but this would be uh, your, your received signal. And there's many things you can do in an ideal sense, but not, very, not many are very, very practical. Back because we skipped a slide. However, there's one attack that I want to talk about that is practical versus SVD based MIMO, and it's, it's actually very simple and very efficient. If I, as a jammer, jam during all of the channel sounding intervals using a common antenna, I can implement what's called a channel rank attack. And so I, as a strong jammer, can force Alice and Bob to both have rank deficient channel estimates. What does this mean? This means that when they go ahead and they compute their SVD, they really only see one good channel because all of their estimates are going to be the same. Now, if Alice and Bob um, use messaging to do their channel estimation, they're both going to use the same exact rank deficient channel estimate. What does that mean? And that means they're going to use a single common SISO channel and MIMO would be defeated. If they, in fact, are using independent estimates, then they're both going to be emptying power into suboptimal and independent <coughs> ID channels, so it's even better. Another very popular scheme that's implemented in a lot of emerging wireless systems, it is 11N, YMAX, and GDP, is the Alamovie Space Time block code. And what it is, uh, is, or excuse me, how we're going to look at this, while these standards allow for higher antenna order implementations, such as you know, to receive and three transmit, four receive, four transmit. We're going to analyze the two by one case, two transmit antennas, one receiver, and then of course you can extend a lot of results two by two and beyond. So what is the Alamovie space time block code? In the two by one sense, Alice has two transmit antennas, Bob has one receive antenna. Here's your channel. H1 and H2 are the channel coefficients. <coughs> Alice wants to send uh, the code to both C1 and C2 to Bob. <coughs> and so during symbol period one, this is what Bob receives. Symbol period two, Alice takes those two symbols, conjugates both of them, and negates one and swaps, and in fact transmits them. What's interesting about the Alice movie's based on plot code is that Alice doesn't even know the channel at all. Only Bob needs to know the channel. And by Looking at uh, the two symbol period uh, equations, you, you results uh, in the following <coughs> minimization trick for the code. So Bob receives G, I mean, excuse me, D, and he operates it on his estimate. Um, excuse me, he receives D, which is the channel operating on. Hold on, let me step back and just be a little bit more clear about this. <coughs> Sorry. So Bob receives R which is the channel operating on C, which is now uh, this code tuple vector with an additive noise component. He takes that received uh, symbol code tuple and operates on it with his, uh, with, his, with his channel estimate. 
Okay. And now for every possible code tuple, he looks to minimize this metric D. But what if Eve's in the mix? If Eve is in the mix and jamming uh, the CSI, G is no longer G, it's now G hat. And so you end up with a, a, new, a new metric here, which has jammed uh, G hats. And as, as Eve, what her goal is, is really to maximize uh, this value, this metric for, for, for the proper symbol tuple and minimize it otherwise. And that's how she can screw up proxy coding. There's a bunch of different solutions here. Uh, one is really just not interesting because this essentially means that E has convinced Bob that the channel is zero, which is just plain silly. Uh, and then there are some other, <coughs> there are some other cases that we, we can look at from an ideal sense. One case that I'm going to talk about right now is the channel inversion attack. By looking at uh, G and doing some analysis there, uh, we realized that the channel state information uh, and bad channel state information is highly affected and acted upon by the constellation that's being used, the modulation constellation. So in a plot over here, we have <coughs> an optimal jamming region for QPS pacing when we're using the LWG by one space time plot code. I'm only looking at a single antenna. And let's assume for a moment that the channel itself is represented by H. By moving H into any of the red region, I've effectively forced Bob to go the wrong symbol tuple. Okay? So, again, you can actually see the QPSK kind of envelope around the signal. So, so noticing this, we can come up with some nice practical uh, attacks. One of which would be what we call the oscillating channel inversion attack. Now, as an attacker, as he, I'm never really sure what Bob's true channel estimate is. But what I can do is leverage the fact that if I'm attacking and I'm not effective here, J, let's say, if I invert my attacking signal, my attacking pilot tone, my attacking rogue estimate by 180 degrees, I am 100% sure to be in the effective jamming region the next time. And so by looking at a high J to S region where um, you know, it, it's practical given uh, the, the, the situation at hand, I can come up with a finite state machine of how well I can do it with this channel inversion attack. And so the idea is that even though I may not be effective 100% of the time, I'm guaranteed to have some level of effectiveness. And so even if I lie in this non-effective jamming region, with probability of one, I will be effective the next time. And then a decent amount of time, I'll be effective all the time. Right, if I'm in this region, I have four ninths, chance, uh, four ninths of, uh, of a chance to, to stay in that completely effective region where I'd be giving K and minus K and K and minus K. So just an interesting observation, and we implemented this in the real world again with GNU Radio and the USRP, where we attacked only the training sequences, and in fact we showed a symbol error rate of 0.65, it's very high. So now that we have <coughs> talked about a bunch of techniques uh, based upon uh, uh, attacks, five-layer based attacks. We want to talk about mitigation techniques. Okay, um, it's a lot of a lot of work in traditional mitigation strategies. Let's talk about a few of them. Well, I might be able to just transmit with more power, uh, or let me be frequency agile. If my jammer is at 2.4 gigahertz, let me move the 5 gigahertz. Let me move around so I can use frequency hopping. Uh, I can perform modulation agility. So rather than using BPSK, let me spread it out and hence spread out my, my jammer's energy when I despread my signal. Uh, I can also incorporate spatial agility if I can. Maybe I'll retreat. I'll go from New Jersey to New Mexico. Who knows? Two techniques that we're going to talk about today, time permitting, will be to how to guard against that MIMO channel state information attack. <coughs> and really we look at a general solution to any CSI system, not just MIMO. And so our solution will be general uh, CSI protection. In addition, we look at a problem of uh, radio teaming. If I'm in a severe multipath scenario and I don't have uh, the link margin to get to my receiver, can I get help from a team of individuals around me to help send this message, even though none of us can communicate reliably to that receiver? So let's talk about the general channel state information protection to begin with. Current emerging systems all use pilots to estimate the channel uh, from 
uh, GSM, eight to 11, uh, everybody. I mean, it's, it, it helps to have an estimate of the channel, and that's why the CSI-based uh, attacks are are so so powerful. So we look at a way to actually authenticate these estimates. There's been a lot of work in this region. However, most of them require a loss in data throughput, or they have restraints with regard to operation within the coherence time of the channel, or require high multipath channels. <coughs> Our technique is general. It can actually work line of sight, and it solves a lot of these problems. So the general framework behind it is to embed an authentication message into the pilot sounding sequence itself. Okay, so we assume Alice and Bob are equipped with the secret key and the sequence number, and they generate an authentication message N. This message N will be used to feed into a pilot mapping function to generate a specific pilot right here that will be combined with the data and sent over the channel. Um, at the receive side, Bob will simply check to see if that authentication message is correct. If it is, he can actually then know that his CSI estimate is validated, it's not been messed, it, messed with, it's good, and he can use it to decode the data. If it has been messed with, if it is incorrect and perhaps corrupted, then he's still okay, maybe. He can, but, but he knows he cannot use that CSI estimate, okay? So he can come up with non-data aided frequency recovery, phase recovery routines to decode the message and, and go from there possibly, but at least he knows something, something funky might be happening, so he's aware of perhaps adversarial presence. Now a couple of schemes that I'll highlight right here involve frequency quantization. Um, the, the main idea here The main idea is actually to exploit the coherence bandwidth property of the channel. And so coherence property, the coherence bandwidth property of the channel says that if I transmit a tone at uh, frequency FC, and then also I transmit a tone at FC plus a very small epsilon, they're going to experience comparable channel effects if they're within the coherence bandwidth of the channel. So by looking at a region and frequency that's within the coherence bandwidth of the channel, I can in fact modify my pilot's frequency to, said, uh, to send this authentication message. So there's a couple of different schemes here. Rather than a traditional pilot, I can use a rel relative frequency code book. And rather than sending my tone here, I, I, I offset in the frequency a little bit. Okay. Now, as a receiver, Bob is aware of the message he's, he's looking for. He can estimate this relative frequency offset and use it to properly decode the data because we don't actually use um, these frequency offsets to send the data just the pilot. And there's various reasons for that that we can probably talk about later if, if you want. <clears throat> now, going on the same line, we can incorporate more authentication bits at, uh, I guess, at, at a trade-off of processing and uh, uh, processing power, really. So we can incorporate what we call the binary frequency code book. And so rather than sending just one tone offset, we can actually send multiple tones. And in essence here, we'll be sending, you know, 0, 1, 0, 1, dot, 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 1 as our authentication message. In addition, we can incorporate power. So rather than just sending a uh, on or off sort of message, we can use power levels. Again, we're in the coherence bandwidth of the channel, so this signal is going to experience the same amplitude fluctuations as this signal by definition of the coherence bandwidth. So a relative drop-off in power can be used to convey this message. And it also, uh, in fact, it gives us a nice method of error inference of an adversary's presence. Not all, yes sir. So could you have, going back one slide, sure. Well, could you have, I mean, you basically are doing on a, well, a sort of a position-based modulation scheme here, and you're also doing uh, amplitude modulation. Yes, sir. Could you also have done some type of phase, phase modulation where you look at phases relative across the subcarrier? Sure, carriers? sure, 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 definitely. Um, the processing to recover from that might be a little bit more complicated because as you're, even if you're, you're on an offset frequency, to get the channel estimate to be usable, 
there's some things that you need to do from a signal processing perspective because you're at a slightly different frequency. And so by focusing mainly on amplitude, it, it simplifies the process. But yes, you could definitely do that. Uh, and the fault be driven by the same uh, local oscillator. Exactly, which is key for, for, for this really to work. And one of the reasons why we don't use um, uh, in the relative frequency code book, you'll note that in any of these, they really need a pilot reference. Now, how many pilot references they need depends upon the scheme. In the relative, in the relative frequency code book, Let's talk about two transmit antennas, and I'll show you an example in the real world. Uh, the first trans transmit antenna is going to be uh, basically the reference, and the second one is going to send the signal because of just that local oscillator instability. Uh, as a receiver of Bob, you know, uh, if Alice sends 2.4 gigahertz, I might receive 2.40175. It will be offset. So I need some sort of baseline, and by mandating that that baseline comes from my own local oscillator, and then, then I'm okay. I can look at relative offsets at my receiver as opposed to um, the actual values, true values. Yes, sir. I may be lacking some background here, but how, how is the key or the codebook shared between the transmit and receiver? Right, so there are various ways to do it. Um, it was kind of out of the scope of the problem itself, but it's, it's a good question. Um, so there's traditional ways to, to come up with that key, but there's also some work that, uh, that, that we've done, and Sue Haas has, has uh, Sue Haas Mother, who just graduated a couple of months ago, um, did some work about uh, acquiring secret keys based upon uh, passive observations in the environment. And so there are, the methodology does exist uh, to obtain a secret key without that initial uh, exchange. Now, not all systems are going to be able to do these frequency offsets or deal with any of that. So there are some schemes um, that we came up with that can accommodate legacy systems that um, uh, might be able to get by with you know, some added processing on the back, back end as opposed to frequency shifting things and, and doing some of these power degradations. Uh, one scheme is called selective usage. Selective usage just says where you have a traditional pilot, either turn it on or turn it off. And so by being active or silent, you can essentially send your authentication as well, uh, as well at a lower bit rate. Now, here's a picture of uh, you know, the experimental validation that, 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 we, uh, that we did in the 1800 megahertz band, and we used a conservative bandwidth estimate to, to, perform these, uh, to, for, to perform these tests. Another area of research that we might look into and that should be look, looked into are ways to come up with um, a uh, nice way to come up with coherence bandwidth estimates. Now, right here is a relative frequency code book experiment where at all of these carriers, we see the nominal reference pilot that happened the antenna before. What we're looking at is amplitude versus frequency for the receiver's second antenna. So the first antenna is in the dotted lines. And uh, it, it, for ease of illustration, I put it in there so you can see the offsets. And so by sending these offsets, we're essentially transmitting authentication messages uh, of 000 because these are odd. This is 111 and 011 based upon the way that we, we mapped our offsets. Uh, the, the key takeaway is these numbers right here. You can obviously uh, map those to any sorts of bits that, that you want. Now, present in this experiment was, the experiment was also Eve. And you can see Eve was trying to perform a CSI based attack and jam our CSI estimate. And rather than attacking all the estimates, she just used one to see if she could do it. She has difficulty getting the proper frequency based upon local oscillator drifts. And so in this case, her frequency offset was definitely detectable. Okay, so she is offset right here and offset in magnitude as well, but that doesn't matter under this scheme. And what happens here is in this, in this scenario, she's deviated into another frequency band and in fact, messed up the authentication message. So while she was successful in jamming the CSI, we detected her presence. Now, using the binary frequency code book experiment, we considered another scenario, where now we're zoomed into the coherence bandwidth of the channel, and we're looking to send the message 11101101. Eve again is present, but this time, she's lucky enough to land within that frequency quantization band. However, she doesn't really know what power level Bob is receiving. And so she can't match her power to coincide with Alice's power received at Bob. 
And so even though she's at the proper frequency and that CSI authentication message is correct, she's still detectable because we see a power deviation here above a given threshold that we define. On here, we just have an illustration of the joint frequency power code book experiment where Eve is no longer present uh, just to show uh, usability of frequency and power within the Torian standard. Uh, so, how does it for Eve to know the code book by looking at the uh, offsets every time? Uh, so, uh, very hard because of the way they're encoded. So, the authentication message itself is going to be generated with a secret key and a sequence number by way of a cryptogra cryptographic one way. <laughs> And so knowledge of a previous uh, message doesn't really help you in getting a future uh, a future uh, message unless you have the key and the sequence number. But good question. <coughs> now, how feasible is this sort of technology? Well, let's consider a current Wi-Fi system, as we talked about earlier, 802.11g, which operates 20 megahertz wide, 64 subcarriers. By using a, an SNR that might uh, originally, I thought 35 dB seemed kind of high, but what that equates to is three to four signal quality bars on, on a Wi-Fi network, so it's not unreasonable. Um, let's see, we used uh, N equals four quantization bins, uh, which is in the signal processing constraints of, of the signal and the length of the messages. Uh, one transmit antenna, only a single transmit antenna, four power quantization levels, and then we looked at using various carriers, anywhere from one to 64. Now, the method is the relative frequency code book, binary frequency code book, and the frequency power code book. And here we have plotted our, of note, authentication bits. How many authentication bits can we get per packet? Uh, which you'll see for frequency power code book and binary uh, frequency code book are fairly high. It's actually um, quite surprising how usable this might be. Um, we also plot the probability of false alarms and the probability of missed detections. So we find probability of false alarm, of course, where adversary Eve is not present and noise, in fact, screws us up, and probability of misdetection is Eve was there and we didn't detect her. Uh, and we see things that we actually would expect, and a surprisingly low uh, probability of misdetection, but that's based upon the, the code book size that we have based on uh, using those so many carriers. Now, uh, I'm not sure how we are on time because it's already two, but there is a final. Uh, mitigation technique uh, that, we, that we talked about previously where we leverage multipath in our favor to perhaps send an emergency message to a, uh, to a receiver that is out of our normal communication range. There's a lot of research in this area, but most of them require highly, highly synchronized transmissions. Transmitters uh, incorporate multi-antenna solutions or really need to know uh, what the, the channel is, an accurate estimate of the channel forming applications or some of the minimal applications that we discussed earlier. And so here we have our, our radio right here who wants to transmit to our target receiver, but there's a high power jammer here and here. And so can he communicate with a few other radios, which might be uh, unlike his radio, if it's a heterogeneous network that he just can com communicate with, um, to leverage beam pattern distortion to the target receiver. And so it's I guess more of a military application than anything else to send a, a low bit rate emergency message when when, you, when somebody's in trouble. Um, <clears throat> spoke about that. So again, here's the protocol. Radio A can't communicate with the intended receiver, and so he chats with his team to coordinate a starting time slot or a rough course time, time to begin transmitting, and uh, he decides the message he wants to, to send. He decides to send a binary one. I want everybody to just transmit at this frequency. Otherwise, remain idle. Then let's use a single interval of two seconds. Again, a little bit weird. Now we transmit the messages. Very important that a single time be selected that is uh, much greater than their synchronization level. In our experiment that we'll show later, we used a network timing protocol, which has you know about 10 millisecond accuracy. So we're well within the um, well within the proper scenario here. At the receiver, he's going to incorporate a <coughs> terrestrial antenna and take cuts, various look angles, to see if he can discover that the overall received beam pattern has been distorted in any which way. Again, stressing the fact that we're exploiting the various multipath arrivals at the receiver. Um, so, 
here's what your bean pattern might look like in the presence of a very strong jammer. Jammer, big lobe right here, not so much at the upper angles. So while we're idle, this is what you see. While all the radio team is now active, the bean pattern gets disturbed or perturbed a little bit here, a little bit there, nothing, nothing enough to allow standard uh, communications. But is this detectable? This is the question. And so for our experiments, what we're doing is we're looking at every receiver look angle and computing a Euclidean distance actually against our single discriminator. Okay? And if we're above a threshold, we declare radio team is active, I'm decoding a one. If they're inactive, we decode a zero. Of course, MATLAB simulations were conducted to prove that you know this is this is feasible, this is something that uh, that might possibly work. And here's the results for the real world. Um, situation where there's course synchronization in time and also course synchronization in frequency. In MATLAB, you might, oh, everybody, you might say everybody transmit at frequency FC, and in MATLAB, everything's going to be exactly FC. So you have pure <laughs> destructive and constructive interference in your simulation. In the real world, local oscillator drifts are going to do this. And so you don't necessarily have as nice uh, constructive destructive interference because they're going to be at different frequencies. And so um, our simulation incorporated those things and it really kind of suggested that this could work in the real world. In the experiment, we had a very high uh, uh, jammer. Uh, J to S was 20 dB. And we used the classical USRP GNU radio to send the following symbols. And we used a very large symbol period of 8 seconds. <coughs> it was an interesting setup because we had a Lego based rotating receiver, I believe, and it was, it was pretty interesting. Uh, the receiver itself was MaxRad 18 dBi directional antenna, and we used eight uniform look angles over, over, over the environment. It was done in the orbit grid, orbit grid, and it was set up to have a high multipath environment uh, using two radio teaming transmitters. By using two radio transmitters and a high uh, multipath environment, um, that we actually had probably 10 to 10 to 11, if I remember the data correctly, uh, different arriving. Uh, significant multipath angles at the receiver. Yes, sir. So, so I, I think I understand that you're encoding the information, the ones and zeros, in terms of the, the beam pattern yes. distinction, and that you've relaxed synchronization requirements because as long as it's within the tolerances of a low bit rate, that's acceptable. Yes. But what about the multi, what does that require in terms of the maximum multipath? Uh, in other yes. words, in other words, uh, the multipath delay can't be greater than the Yes, yeah, so you, you definitely want the definite. So, yeah, so a, in the real world point. application, what, what does that mean? Right, so let's see, delay spreads uh, for you know urban environments, like, let's see, are going to be much smaller than the rates we're talking about here, around the order of microseconds right here. Uh, so, uh, but again, that's a, that's, a, that's a great point, right, your, your delay spread versus Korean bandwidth. I just didn't know. Yeah. Actually, I have a slide later on I can pull up in the, the chat that talks about uh, uh, delay spreads of not necessarily severe multipath environments, uh, but you know indoor uh, microcellular, is it outdoor and so on and so forth. And um, yeah, I mean you're talking on the order of microseconds, one microsecond, seven microseconds for, for average. Uh, so again, experimental results here. Uh, we're looking at a single symbol, and in red we have only the jammer active. So only the only the jammer is active here. And in blue, we have transmitters active. You can clearly see in the real world that we're perturbing this beam pattern uh, in, in terms of magnitude fairly well. Uh, on the right, we have magnitude uh, and variance of, of the received signal. And what we were going for, again, was that where the jammer doesn't effectively penetrate uh, from an approach angle, uh, our radio team, by leveraging multipath, can fill those low JS regions in. And so the problem is a detection problem of, of determining whether or not we're on overall. Um, with regard to actually decoding our message, we were able to, based upon a, uh, a, a threshold right here, so perfect decoding of the low bit rate emergency response message. Uh, in summary right now, uh, we talked today about various physical layer techniques to provide situational awareness, attack, and then also mitigate um, once you acquire all these types of information. And we actually showed a lot of uh, a lot of these techniques in the real world using GNU Radio and USRP. Um, 
various things for future research, you know, uh, with regard to situational awareness. We did device identification of Wi-Fi access points because they're stationary. Well, you could look at the problem of Wi-Fi client differentiation. They also have training sequences and equalization uh, sequences, but the problem is the transmissions are aperiodic and mobile, so it's a tougher problem. Um, we had done some work during the course of this thesis in channel model driven statistical clustering analysis. And so there are some interesting things to exploit the delay spread of channels, outdoor versus indoor, and their effect on other features such as the magnitudes of, um, uh, of Wi-Fi clients and things like that. There are some results in the thesis where we show clear clustering of magnitudes uh, to denote whether I am as a receiver inside versus outside. Uh, partially observable modulation recognition, right? Um, if I'm only looking, and this is this is very uh, uh, very important for DSA networks uh, when you're using things like cognitive radios, where I'm tuned in frequency at this four megahertz interval, I'm never sure that the, the, another cognitive radio is going to be in my scope of view. So maybe I'm only getting a portion of it. So can I do some some interesting detection problems, some modulation recognition, perhaps? using just a portion of, of the signal. Uh, that's kind of an interesting problem. So you did some of that, actually. Yeah. Well, not from that not point of view, but the fact that you were limited to connecting to the USRP over USB. Yes. So one. Exactly. Okay, and then you could only get four megahertz of sample rate anyway. Right. So we looked at it. You, you're right, 100%. We looked at it in terms of device discovery and service discovery. but not necessarily from a pure modulation recognition uh, problem such as that was that was an APSK signal or even um, you know th things along things along that line. So we leverage protocol specific information that like to do pure blind modulation recognition, you know, QPSK versus APSK. If I only have a portion of my signal, are there some things that I can do based upon blind timing recovery and uh, symbol time um, uh, estimation. There's, there's, it's an interesting, uh, I think, an interesting problem. In addition, there's the concept of intentional aliasing with a software-defined radio. In the future, and currently with a hardware mod in the USRP, I can remove filters and change out the PGA code to intentionally allow other areas of interest to alias into my region. So even though I'm tuned at this four megahertz, I can see everybody out to 100 megahertz to either direction. While that doesn't help me to know that this user is at this frequency, it does help me to know who is there, and if anybody is in any of this region. And so it would be kind of an interesting problem. Uh, in, in fact, Dominic and Spill, the individuals who implement the GR Bluetooth, talk about doing that to passively eavesdrop on the entire 79 megahertz range of Bluetooth using USRP or USRP2 or one or the other. So it, it's an interesting, interesting issue. Uh, radio team, and we talked about multiple radios. Well, can we use single radios to also do this thing by changing my transmit angle? Okay, so that's kind of an interesting idea. Um, and then, of course, some ways to protect the tire pressure monitoring system exploits that, that, that we did. It's, uh, I guess, a paragraph of this, of this thesis. So um, we have some good ideas there about how to exploit the visible layer to. Um, <coughs> to provide, I guess, sensor to ECU authentication. So one, one idea would be to directionalize the, the, um, the, the receiver and put him in certain areas. If I place my car's uh, tire pressure sensor receiver directly above the wheel well and I handle it now, well, the only place an attacker is really going to be, if I shield it properly enough, the only way an attacker is really going to be able to embed a, a, a transmission is to be under the ground and turns it straight up. Right, so there are certain physical limitations that, that he has that prevent, uh, that prevent certain attacks if you do things like that. <coughs> uh, references and questions, comments?